Hello, Vanessa. All right. So um, we are looking at today the Black Legend. And so I wanted to um, share the page with uh, a, a few different documents, uh, one of them just being these rudimentary notes. All right. And so what we're looking at today is um, the Spaniards, right? Uh, it's particularly the Whig Party in England. Uh, they wrote very ill of the Spanish and, and the way that they colonized the Americas. And of course they had, they stood something to gain from it, right? Is they, they were fighting the Spanish for the Americas, fighting them in the Caribbean, et cetera. And um, they were wanting to depict themselves as a lesser evil than the Spanish. And so the Spaniards, right? When these, these negative depictions of them, of being these, these villainous, monstrous, uh, uh, figures in the history books and the chronicles, uh, they said that this was all a, a black legend. It was all just a, a, a dark lie um, about them. So that's where we get the term black legend. Um, and so to what extent do the Spanish serve as a, as a convenient anti-model today, right? Uh, so today, right, we, we value uh, egalitarianism, uh, everyone being on equal footing. Uh, we value uh, you know, from the Enlightenment, um, the idea of the social contract, uh, accountability of our rulers, uh, limited powers, checks and balances, um, you know, and, and a lot of those Enlightenment beliefs that you find, uh, the Spanish, you know, you have to remember that this is, this is centuries before the Enlightenment. And so to what extent is that really fair to the Spanish uh, to, to, uh, you know, to evaluate them by today's standards. So at any rate, um, what are some of the things that, that might have seemed uniquely, um, you know, kind of archaic, like old school, uh, before the Enlightenment, before the modern era, uh, just dark ages way of doing things, right? And so you could adhere to the black legend, because remember in history, you select facts, and then you also conveniently omit facts, right? So you choose the facts that you want to um, extrapolate on, and then you choose how to interpret those facts and how to present them. And so there's a lot of, you know, opinion and subjectivity that's involved in history <clears throat> that, that renders us, you know, uh, capable of being quite manipulative in history books. So at any rate, with the Spanish, uh, for one, right, is La Conquista, the, 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 the conquest is as you see in number one, if you've had the chance to look at your handout, uh, this was kind of a, you know, by today's standards, a barbaric system uh, whereby, let me uh, bring us to the black legend assignment, number one, where Christopher Columbus and these others, right, they, they have this opportunity, this unique opportunity, unless they wanted to rise up by way of the church or the military, which seemed to have been there throughout the medieval time period and early modern era. But it, what if you didn't want to be a priest? What if you didn't want to be uh, a soldier? Um, you had another opportunity, and that was to be a yes man to these merchants, uh, these big merchants. All right, Rigoberto, nice to have you. Make sure that I give you credit for being here. Um, so at any rate, let's see here. Um, so the, the, the correct answer that you would give one of these merchants, right, because the Italian word for, for uh, bank was bench, they'd sit at a, a bench, and they would ask you, why do I want to lend my money to you, kind of a shark tank type thing, right, uh, and of course the, the correct, the politically correct answer was to contend, uh, because I will do whatever you ask of me, right, that I won't have any moral qualms with, with whatever errands you send me on, and I'll, I'll do as asked, as, as commanded. And so that's the game that, that, that Columbus played, right? And on number one, I'm really, really uh, pushing the envelope and trying to excuse what he did subsequently when he came into the Americas 
because he could be quite ruthless. He had some of his men executed before the others uh, when they um, they tried to go off on their own and, and find silver and gold in Puerto Rico and other areas of the Caribbean. Um, uh, some were, they were thinking about splitting on him. Uh, and then to more serious things of having a, a mutiny and have him um, uh, arrested and, and, and uh, supplanted with another new ruler, et cetera. And uh, his, his military alliance with the, uh, the Arawak tribe in the Caribbean, uh, they, they ended up killing his soldiers at Fort Navidad. And uh, supposedly because the soldiers were raping the Native American women, the Arawak women on this Caribbean island. And so uh, when he came back and he found gunpowder wound uh, on the leg of, uh, I believe it was Cannibal, uh, the cacique, the chief, uh, he wanted blood. And so he had a very vindictive side, a very kind of Machiavellian side. Um, and then even before the, the, the famous four trips through the Americas, um, you know, he traded in slaves, as, as I put here in number one. Uh, he fought over Spice Islands and other areas, uh, and on Kios and other islands, and um, drew blood. Um, but he was told to, right? And so I'm continuing on number one, which I have tongue in cheek as I put it together, is that it's not his fault. It's the system. It's this barbaric system that that is going to um, promote and reward such violence. Uh, where they tell them, right, hey, go to the Moluccas, to the Spice Islands, and take them from the Portuguese or from the Dutch, and do it by any means necessary. You know, kill whomever you have to kill. Uh, take them over and begin, you know, uh, I want to begin um, selling those spices. Uh, go to um, Elmina or Luanda, one of the main ports on the Ivory Coast of Africa, and get me two to 300 slaves. African slaves, right, from the Asante or Yoruba or other African tribes, and, um, and bring them up to me. And so you had to have, you had to be amoral, right, uh, to, to take this, this opportunity of advancement uh, by way of, uh, of being a merchant, right, a, a warrior merchant. And that's what happens here with Spain, is they were already fighting the reconquest, as you guys have have learned from the from the second assignment, uh, if you haven't done that yet, it, it pertains to the um, the Muslim takeover of uh, of Spain, known as Al Andalus, and the Spaniards' reconquest. Their somewhat their alleged crusade uh, to take Spain back uh, from the Umayyad Caliph, and so uh, they began rewarding their warriors. And telling them you defeat enemies in a certain area, you could be entitled to uh, Hidalgo or minor um, nobility status, and you could be granted um, uh, labor, the, the forced labor of the people that you dominate uh, on the military battlefield, known as the, uh, the infamous encomienda system. And so they carried that over into the Americas. And they did the same with the Aztec and the other Native American tribes, right, uh, that they conquered. So this idea of rewarding people for coming over, and oftentimes, right, they had to find their own funds. And so it was a win-win for the crown, because the crown didn't have to venture much uh, as far as money and resources, and allowed the private individuals of Spain to risk everything, life and limb and, and all their money and assets, uh, and if they fail, they fail. That's on the individual. And uh, but if they succeed, the crown gets credit. Uh, that soil goes under the flag of Castile under um, Isabella, and uh, they get a royal one fifth, the royal quinto of of most um, earnings. And so, at any rate. That kind of system is what you see on number one of your assignment. And I'm trying to make an excuse for people such as Christ, uh, Cristobal Colon, Christopher Columbus, um, as, as a mercenary, um, if you will, and saying it's the system that we should hate, uh, that brutal system, uh, not the individuals who took advantage of it. 
And so uh, what do you know? A lot of them who did take advantage of it were second sons of Hidalgo's. So you can kind of do the math and infer that dad had fought against the Muslims uh, uh, kind of um, as far as the statistics go. A lot of their fathers had fought against the Muslims and had been rewarded Hidalgo status. And under the Mayorazgo, everything went to the hijo mayor, to the oldest son. And so second and third and fourth sons didn't receive anything under that system, but they had seen their dad get a taste of a better life uh, by way of military means of fighting. And so they, 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 um, they emulated their dads. So Hernan Cortez, as a case in point, uh, coming here, right, known as the conqueror of the Aztec. So at any rate, it's something to think about. I'm going to go back to this sheet. Uh, so the La Conquista, right, you get, you get some brutal accounts. Uh, if you want to read Las Casas or Sagun, their accounts on Cortez, uh, he's depicted as being very... Um, Machiavellian, manipulative, greedy, ruthless, uh, dishonest, etc. And then, of course, you have uh, Pizarro and others in South America, and the famous case of um, of uh, oh, Fray Fray Marcos de Nisa and 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 Bartolome de las Casas, in writing in their work. Um, about um, the betrayal of Atualpa, of the Inca uh, emperor, and his being strangled or drowned uh, by the conquistadores, they, they lied to him and allied with him against his rival, uh, only to demand a, a ridiculous ransom for his life. And then when he paid above and beyond the amount demanded of the ransom, uh, they killed him anyway. And so at any rate, you, you have those accounts, in Las, especially with authors like Las Casas, etc., to show a brutal conquest by private individual soldiers, soldiers of fortune, uh, coming forward to claim lands that were, um, that were quote, pagan, uh, with the blessing, as you see on number two, of Alexander VI, the Pope, who happened to be a Spaniard at that time, um, the Alexandrian papal bulls uh, gave uh, a blank check to the Spaniards to go ahead and conquer uh, as long as they um, converted the souls of the Native Americans. And it was known as El, uh, El Patronato. Uh, the, the Patronato gave the, the crown of Spain, of Castile and Aragon, uh, gave Ferdinand and Isabella the right and future monarchs of Spain uh, to decide how uh, the conversion process would go down. And of course, there was a lot of latitude. Um, <clears throat> you could choose a more, uh, a less um, intrusive way, uh, like the missions, uh, in that I say less intrusive in that they did not force people, allegedly. And to the missions, it was by choice, and um, and yes, there was there was corporal punishment, but they didn't kill um, the, the the neophytes unless you you think of it as inadvertently killing them uh, through pathogens, right, through disease. Um, but I, I'm contrasting that with the uh, requerimiento, and the requerimiento, the requirement gave them 24 hours to accept the Roman Catholic Church and the, the Catholic Christian faith, uh, or else the Spaniards would declare holy war against them. And they actually did that on U.S. territory in New Mexico against the Pueblo um, Native Americans. And so uh, the papal bulls, right, ensured that, that the Spanish were going to be especially, um, you know, uh, ethnocentric uh, their their um, worldview, their religion was the only one that mattered. It was the center of the universe, and they were going to impose it on the Native Americans. So again, that might be supportive of the Black legend of the Spanish 
showing us how not to be today, right? Uh, showing us uh, proven to be a, a convenient anti-model for today's values. And then um, the royal bureaucracy, uh, we've gone over the stats on that. I believe that's like number three. I give the um, specifics on the royal bureaucracy. Let's see what number it is. Number two is telling, the title is telling. Right here, yeah, number three, hierarchical Spain. And so there with this, um, with this one, right, I, I'm not making any excuses for the Spanish. I'm contending, I'm adhering to the black legend on number three and contending that they, um, they were very lacking in the department of egalitarianism, everyone on equal footing, um, democratic representative government, um, equality of opportunity economically for all. Uh, you're not going to see that in number three, right? And so just to give you some, a couple examples of that with the royal bureaucracy is you have some offices that you're not going to find in um, English North America. You're going to have a viceroy. Not only that, the Royal Council of the Indies Uh, made the laws way back in Spain, uh, handpicked guys. The viceroy was the, the, the vice king. Another position that was particularly hated were the corregidores. Um, the corregidores, like the word corregir to correct in Spanish, they could um, undo decisions made by uh, the city councils and the alcalde mayores, the mayors. And they demanded tribute. They took tax revenue from the people at the at the regional level, and they were representatives of the royal prerogative. Um, also, with the the royal bureaucracy, uh, they could declare the um, the repartimiento, and the repartimiento were uh, public works that Native Americans had to uh, engage in, and so uh, for the state. For the Spanish state, and so uh, you know, you could find evidence of a of a pretty hierarchical system uh, under a, a somewhat tight grip uh, of Spain over the Americas, right? And so then, um, mercantilist restrictions is you had the uh, the consulado, and the consulado they were uh, they ran the mercantilist system. I remember with mercantilism. Um, it's the assumption that um, resources are finite and the crown deserves the prerogative of deciding to whom and for whom certain opportunities and access to certain resources will be available. So hence like the big money makers like uh, cocoa and sugar and slavery and gold mining gold and silver uh, you had to be very well connected with the consulado to deal business-wise in those commodities. Uh, they, they oftentimes worked with uh, monopolies. Okay, and so, uh, and the argument is, it's still on that number three of your handout, is that sometimes the scraps uh, off the table were left for the common um, citizens of Latin America, but just that, that's about it, as far as uh, economic opportunities go. So if you wanted to support the Black legend, there's certainly evidence to support it um, in depicting them as an anti-model for today, how not to be today, right? Um, how uh, depicting them as being kind of archaic uh, old school in a negative way, right? But then, what about in defense of the Spaniards? Well, for one, um, the the Anglos, right? The the English, um, they dispossessed the Native Americans from their land, 
And so what I, if I haven't done it yet, I believe I have, I'll make sure that I have, okay? Um, I'm gonna put up just for supplemental reading, at, not an assignment, um, but I'm gonna put up from my US history class, um, a, a handout on the Southern colonies of, of the English colonies and a handout on the Northern English colonies and let you, you know, make some comparisons and contrasts uh, as far as that goes. So yes, there wasn't a system. Uh, when you look at, you know, um, Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, you look at um, uh, Carlos I, known as Charles V of, of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, they gave sanction to, uh, to holy war, uh, to fighting non-Catholics, and to being um, rewarded for doing such. But uh, so did Elizabeth, right, of England, Queen Elizabeth. Um, James I didn't because he was probably a closet Catholic. Um, and then Charles I and Charles II had their own drama. Charles I will die in a civil war and be beheaded by his own parliamentary forces. Uh, and so the argument is, is that England, by contrast in some degree, um, had bigger fish to fry than the North American colonies. They did not bring in the same type of revenue that the Spanish colonies were bringing in from Mother Spain. And so they didn't seem to be as high of a priority. So the English didn't send in this royal bureaucracy of a viceroy and something equivalent to the corregidores, et cetera. But they sent in royal governors and the royal governors could handpick royal councilmen. And they, those two bodies could outnumber the colonial reps known as the assemblymen or the house of Burgesses. Uh, the assemblies were the spokespeople for the, the colonies, for the regular colonial people. Uh, but you look at Howard Zinn and his book on U.S. history, and he contends that, shoot, those uh, assemblymen did not see themselves as a mini example of their constituents, as a microcosm of their constituents. They saw themselves as an elite group in and of themselves that were too good for and better than the people that they were ostensibly supposed to represent. So you had hierarchies, uh, look through those handouts. Um, you know, the, the Puritans and the Pilgrims were so proud in the New England states of Massachusetts Bay Colony and Plymouth Colony and New Hampshire and Connecticut and Rhode Island. They, they were at the forefront as you see in the handout in, in certain scientific innovation with vaccines. Um, and they, they established the Ivy League schools. Um, they uh, elected and quote, unelected their own pastors. And they didn't have as hierarchical of a system in church uh, with their congregational system of church organization. And they were very proud of that. Uh, their, um, what was it? Uh, the old deluder law uh, demanded that uh, villages of a certain size and population should have to have a, an elementary school for the kids there. Uh, you could read all this in that handout. Um, <clears throat> so they, they had some things that they could boast of. And um, not to mention that they had a, um, a charter uh, that they brought with them 3,000 miles across the Atlantic that they claim gave them a lot of latitude to do as they pleased uh, from, the, from the English crown. So you don't see the same degree uh, when you look at a few English kings uh, versus Spanish ones. You don't see at times the same jealousy, that same fear of losing power to the colonials. Uh, amongst the English crowns that you that you do amongst the Spanish. Uh, and I don't begin to know early modern Europe well enough to give a, a great thesis as to why that is. Um, but, but I can say is that as far as dispossessing the Native Americans from their land, as far as forming their own clicky hierarchies and aristocracies, 
Remember, Aristoi means the best in Greek. So this self-proclaimed elite group, right? You're going to find that in all the colonies, uh, the New England ones as well. So with New England, uh, you know, you look at, at the, the constant uh, electoral turnover of the same elite religious leaders uh, time and time again. Uh, you look at the Salem witch trials and the way that, that they, they had a culture of angst and tyranny of the majority, uh, et cetera, um, that you find there in, in uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony amongst the Puritans. Uh, look at some of their wars, the Pequo War, uh, King Philip's or Medicom's War. They, the English fought brutally uh, against the, um, the Native Americans. Uh, on occasions fighting Native American tribes that they were supposed to be allied with during the wars, like the Narragansett tribe, um, and also writing in their history books that their Judeo-Christian God, when he smelt the, um, the burning flesh of the natives uh, in a village, um, like the Fort Mystic Massacre, uh, that it was pleasing aroma to his nostrils, and they totally you know, um, perverted a, a biblical verse from the Old Testament on like grain offerings that didn't even involve bloodshed, uh, much less human bloodshed, uh, taking it out of context like that. And so, um, yeah, so the Anglos could be just as bad at dispossessing Native Americans from their lands. They could become just as clicky and forming their own colonial aristocracies. And I show that on number five of your handout in colonial Virginia, uh, known as the gentry class. Um, the gentry class were uh, accustomed to having people be deferential toward them. Uh, back in England, they were big landowners and forced and had people work the land for them on their behalf. And they, they became the, the aristocracy of the South. Uh, this gentry class. And then, my goodness, read about Bacon's Rebellion, uh, uh, especially in Howard Zinn's book, uh, where it contends that, you know, a gentleman has a, an infamous quote where he says, you know, unhappy are they in a colony where six out of seven um, don't even know basically where the next meal is going to come, uh, that it was such an inequitable um, oligarchy, uh, the, the few, the very few in number, uh, possess the lion's share of land and food and wealth, etc., at the expense of the majority. And it blew up in a people's rebellion, arguably a people's rebellion. I say arguably because Nathaniel Bacon was not a regular commoner. Uh, he was an aristocrat himself, which is a bit ironic. Uh, but nevertheless, look at the rebellion, his following, their, their declaration, etc. And you'll find plenty of inequity, of unfairness and in economic imbalance uh, in, the, in the English colonies as well as in the Spanish colonies. And then, um, yeah, so uh, let's see here. Let me make sure that I'm not missing something major. And number two, I, I kind of give the thesis away, right? As I make the argument that the Spanish, because of the Reconquista in particular, and what was going on in their generation and the context they were leaving back in Spain, that they didn't know any better, that they, they they, they couldn't extricate themselves from their own bias if they wanted to. Um, and that's, that's very arguable. And so feel free to choose that one and disagree with it, if you like. But I noted that, you know, you don't have the scientific revolution yet, you don't have the enlightenment yet, you don't have classical liberalism yet, uh, to, to teach the Spaniards differently as far as imposing religion by 
the threat or use of force upon others. And then I'm sure you've, you probably have thought about this as well as, you know, you also think when you do the black legend of lesser evil uh, argument is, okay, the, the Native Americans may have been somewhat subjugated, um, somewhat marginalized in Spanish America, uh, but they were allowed to, they were allowed to, to integrate with the, with the Spaniards, with the, the Europeos. Um, they, as of 1513 or 1519, the, the, the Mestizaje law, the miscegenation law, they were allowed to, uh, to procreate and, and marry uh, Europeans. Uh, they engaged in secretism where they blended their cultures. Um, and so, yeah, you have um, mistreatment and, and marginalization, but at least they were allowed to, to live amongst the Europeans and live with them, et cetera. With the English, by and large, the Native Americans were, were pushed to the side. They were, they were completely, you know, uh, I don't even know if I would say marginalized, uh, almost beyond that. Uh, and so, you know, which one is the lesser evil? And so, uh, any rate. So you have three, two, and three. Number four, Spanish missions were a proverbial mixed bag. And that, that says what my thesis is right there. All right. So you have evidence of good intentions on behalf of the Spaniards. And so that's known as Spanish court history, uh, defending the Spanish uh, friars for their paternalism, uh, their, their desire to improve the lives of the natives and their protectiveness over the natives uh, regarding the Spanish Presidio soldiers and some of the Spanish um, inhabitants of the, of the nearby Pueblos were known to try to exploit and take advantage of and harm the Native Americans. And oftentimes the Native Americans knew they could go to the friars and the priests to protect them. Um, the type of dedication and, and, and self-sacrifice that Sarah and some of them uh, supposedly engaged in, uh, you know, rendered Sarah becoming a saint uh, by Pope Francis uh, less than a decade ago. And, um, but then you had a guy named Van Kotzebue, and he went and, and visited the missions, and he described them as coercive and, and guilty of cultural genocide, right? Forcing the Native Americans uh, to disregard, to quote, kill uh, their own culture. And so that's something to think about as well uh, with, with the Black legend. And then you had inadvertent um, damage through, um, through the Colombian exchange, right? Uh, animal, plant life, pathogens, germs, et cetera, that the Europeans brought and mixed with the Native Americans. Sometimes those had deadly consequences for the Native Americans. Uh, so uh, a, a source I cite on here is uh, Children of Coyote, uh, the California missions uh, has kind of that overall thesis. And then number five is deflection. Saying, okay, maybe the Spanish don't hit today's standards worth a darn, but do the English, especially the English down in Virginia? And that's a rhetorical question. The answer obviously is no, they don't either. All right, so um, does anybody have any comments? Any comments or questions? All right, can I get a thumbs up from the two of you? You guys able to hear me and you haven't, you haven't yet died of boredom?
You guys there? Can you guys hear me? Thank you. All right, good, good, good. All right, thank you, Rigoberto. All right, so if you guys don't have any other questions, that's it for me. Um, we're going to slow down now because you haven't quite had your second uh, assignment due, and this is the third assignment. So um, we'll, be, we'll be slowing down. I'll, I'll let you guys know via uh, Canvas message uh, when our next um, Zoom meeting will be, okay? All right, well, you guys take care, uh, the two of you. I want to make sure that you guys get your, your extra credit. All right, well, have a good day, okay? Have a good week. Good luck with everything. Thank you, Professor. Have a good one. You as well, Rigoberto. Thank you, man. Appreciate it.